Helen of Four Gates by Ethel Carney Chapter 1 Arise in the World A day in May was drawing to its close. The country between Brungerley and Little Morton took on a wilder look, a shadow after shadow, obliterated signpost, trespass board, gate, stile, and the little fences put up by small farmers. This North England changed subtly from a domesticated intersected land into one huge dark county. Night with a laugh of anarchy blotted out the symbols of law and order, gave infinity for acres, reclaimed for a short time the wild that was half tame, and lent a sense that here fierce dark deeds had been done and might be done again. For why should not fierce dark deeds happen here again? The glimmering before the final closing down of darkness showed woods blackening against the sunset, woods bearing names that told of the worship of Odin and Thor. Rocks going blackly into the gloaming were said to be the altars of the Druids. Rain from the northern clouds had fallen into those rock basins, unprofaned by the human hand. Those bridges, becoming dense and iron thick in their blue blackness, as they span river and broad stream, were many of them the work of Roman soldiery. A few watercourses still held the red rays of sunset. They glittered like fire snakes, twining through the darker paintness of the landscape, murmuring through funereal waving plumes of blackening grass and rushes. They had witnessed the chasing of witches to their deaths. Here, where all was now still, save for the wailing cry of the peewit, those beings had shrieked aloud their innocence, or borne aloft on the maddened wings of ambitious ecstasy, had proclaimed their power to raise the quick and the dead, to curse if they could not bless, hate if they could not love, clothing themselves with sombre majesty, playing with elemental fires, rather than eat porridge humbly, bow to the squire, and tremble before the priest. A shuttle of darkness ran across the sky, weaving a web over earth, water, and the air, making a scene fit for such power-loving mortals to move in, as seen from the old road running between stone walls. High on the darkening hills, those stone walls encroached. Storm-driven sheep might cow behind them, their impotent bleatings drowned in the crash of thunder, and clap of cloudburst. The hills looked broader, higher, as they blackened. The sky, still red between the gaps in the ice of the hill walls, gave an uncanny, dizzying look to those rifts in the ebon gloom, as if they led down and under the edge of the earth. But over there were other hill ridges, their peaks hidden in mist and cloud. The valleys between were strewn with factory towns, here and there was a furnace, whose glare and after-darkness would soon change the night sky like the eye of some fire-god opening and closing. Over there, too, lay little Morton, the tramp -hole. Overshadowed by the Pennines, damp with the rolling vapours of their heads, it received into its arms of crooked streets the weak, the broken, the incapable, the unwanted, and anon the rebellious. It was a bowl in the hills. The towns round about spat away from themselves those who were broken, or those who would not bend. They became tramps. They fell into this giant spittoon of sober sorrow, drunken mirth, where the man who was not wanted took the woman who was not wanted, where they toiled together, drank together, fought together, recognising no law but necessity. The old road knew the feet of the weary race who floated in and out of Little Morton, each time disgusted and desperate. It ran away from it towards the grand sweep of moors, but it ran back to it hopelessly, hopelessly. Curlew, peewit and grouse called apart and together. It was like the cries of three separate hearts, yet the moor had owned them all. A few scranny bushes bending over the stone wall were caught by a wind which started up in the darkness. The unseen hand of it swept the branches. A little croon of shuddering joy 
ran through bush, first clump, the million field rushes, the rusty heather. Soon everything was shouting with wild, restless music, like the fierce cry of a fierce heart for love or hate or power, all sweet things. It grew ever darker, wind, blackness, solitude. It was witches' country at the hour when their spells were worked, when will o' the wisps carried his wavering lamp over black moss, blacker pool, and shaking bog, when Barges, the moorland spirit dog, followed the lonely traveller caught in the net of darkness, the weird paws sounding splosh blosh behind him on the soppy ground. It was the hour when children spawned by the bog were found to be claimed at length by the bog, after they had tasted human joy, human sorrow. In the sky, one lingering beam of light trembled like a sword, dipped in red, against a pall of death. Woo! Woo! shouted the wind deliriously. Two pairs of heavy footsteps sounded through the darkness. By and by they paused. The light of a match spluttered upon the gloom. On they came again. Beside a milestone they paused. Two dark figures were almost indistinguishable from the surroundings, but their voices flowed into the night. The tone of them was like a tired curse. The nigher I get, the more I feel like turning back, confessed one voice. In answer there was a sound of a laugh that had in it callous scorn. Flayed of a woman, jibed the one that had laughed. Thou doesn't know Sally, said the first man weakly. When I think of her face... It all seems madness what I dreamt by the doss house fire. It's a sort of madness comes o'er a tramp now and then to go back to the respectable folk. The footsteps came to a pause. The second man laughed again. That really means it. To a wart how this way for now, he exclaimed, a comical wonderment in his voice. Nay, not for now, said his companion. For I'll sort her to be satisfied for another year. A man that can't manage a woman, chimed the other. Give us a leap, said his companion. Then I'll be off back, a man that never makes thy match. There was the sound of his pal fumbling in his pocket. I'd smash her jaw or her heart, he said determinedly. Hear that, but buck up, old lad. There's a pub in village only half a mile away. A pub with a soft-hearted landlord and a doubter as hard as nails. Come and take lessons off me how to deal with the creatures. I'll promise to get snap and rattle for thee and me without wearing a penny piece. There was a pause. This last appeal seemed to be effective. His mate was thinking of that lonely stretch of darkness behind him. Then of the picture he had just had conjured up before him. Come in. There was silence again. Then Jim Brett spoke. I'll get back, he said briefly. In his voice there was something of rude dignity. All right, answered the other. That'll be walking all night. Mind that doesn't meet the ghost of that pack horse man. He carries his own head under his arm. Jim Brett chuckled now. I'm no unflayed of ghosts, he said. But by goff, I were flayed when I thought of Sally's eyes looking me through. Well, good luck, old lad. I hope they'll get on at Brungerley. They'll be back again soon. Little Morton is the last place God made, but they all come back. I'm never going back any more, was the answer he got, given with quiet determination. Jim Brett laughed. Never any more, repeated the other quietly, firmly. In that case, we shan't meet again, said Brett. So long, I've got a long way to go. He swung round and disappeared in the darkness. Fielding day struck on towards the village inn. He soon reached it, a low-built, homely place with red window curtains. His eyes glinted with hungry longing. He entered, standing in the full light of the bar. Dainty Polly Cherry looked up, paused, and stared at that which stood before her. If a scarecrow could look handsome, it might be said that Fielding Day was such a handsome scarecrow his rags appeared to have been gathered with a harlequin-like disregard for harmony, but it was the boots upon him 
peering below the frayed edges of his trousers that told his class and clan they clung to his feet by some miracle revealing at intervals pallid dirty toes he was a tramp weaver on the rocks as his clan would put it rude poetry in the symbolism they used so callously he had the face of a man who has left dreams behind grand nate he remarked to polly jerry with a nod almost of patronage she looked at his clothes baffled by his own unconsciousness of his position he was a tramp yet he spoke as if he had honoured the place by straying in she decided not to notice him but even as she did so his eyes caught hers and held hers it might be a worse night she said astounded to hear herself say it the kitchen's to the left the tramp nodded passing along till he came to the open door of the kitchen Entering, he sat down on a form, then took out a broken stem pipe and lit it. He looked through the smoke that curled from the pipe upon the scene before him. Low roof, black beamed, hunting pictures on the buff painted walls. The room was occupied by a company of rough, homely men. They also sat on forms ranged round by the walls, white boarded tables before them, holding their blue banded pint pots. From the rafters hung golden cakes, sweet herbs are drying, and flitches of home cured. A big fire spluttered in the wide grate. Over it hung a stupor, occasionally spitting into the fire. The scent from that pot penetrated every corner of the long room. Firelight and lamplight brought gleams from silver and pewter in a corner cupboard. In a large brass-wide cage a parrot strutted upon its perch. There was a lull in the conversation, awaiting expression on the various faces. Some rivalry appeared to exist between a ruddy, pumpkin-bellied man and a pale little chap whose coat, covered with threads of cotton weft, stamped him as a weaver, whilst the tin food box and tea can standing on the floor between his feet intimated that he had not yet been home to his tea. The ruddy man looked scorn at his opponent, then, leaning across the table towards him, he apparently went on where he had left off. She's the finest pair of hearing in her head, for here to John O'Groats, he said warmly. I'm no one defending her hats being queer, but she never handles a penny piece in yon house, and thou crack pot buys everything for her. Andrew there says no woman as had wear such hats can be reached in her head. She don't buy them hats herself. Then he says she goes maundering round it dark and wheat as if she were a pendle for his witch. Why shouldn't a lass go out in her wheat and dark if she wants to? It's hardly darker anywhere nor in yon farm kitchen with those coming down nights at Winderstone and River crying away below like it can't help it and all them dark muttering trees about. And then look at th' old chap, always quiet and broody a chunnering to herself, and else daft and in all mats of mischief when the moon's at full and she's got no friends save my wife lizzie if that lass had had a grain of madness in her she'd have gone by this she's all right i'd lay my neck to a seed on it and any chap that says otherwise has got to prove his words or i'll make him eat em so look sharp andrey for i want to be toddling home i prove thy point andrey said an old man with a white pow, his nostrils dark with snuff taking, his eyes cute as a weasel's. She's a lass of jump fancy, as sure as my name's Ben Ling, for she looks like she won't wait to be axed, but it's a serious thing to say anybody is only ninepence to shilling, and the least I can do is to prove she's dotty. I could prove it right enough, said Andrew knowingly, but I don't want to do it, lass any harm. His opponent pricked his ears up at this. There, said Teddy Tripp triumphantly, he can only cast innuendos. None of them long words, Teddy, growls somebody. It isn't fair in an argument. Plain English will do for us. Andre sniggered. What I say is, said he, to use short words as everybody knows and not try and not folk down with a foreign language. There was a murmur of applause. Teddy got rested. Art a going to prove what thou said about Ellen Mason, or come round back, he exploded after a moment, in which the blood of a race of fighting men had risen in him. 
Somebody pulled him down in his seat. I've told thee, said Andre solemnly, I don't want tart, lass. It were only by accident subject came up, but I could prove it right enough. Thou can't, sneered Teddy. That wriggling now. Can't I by goff, said the little man. He squared his narrow shoulders at the challenge. An old beer for Andre, called someone, and Polly Cherry entered, bringing it. She cast a look at the tramp as she set it down. He did not order. She saw the game. He was waiting until snap and rattle was served out to get it for nothing. She determined he should not have it. The tramp smiled, meeting her eye, and again she did not say what she wanted to say. Well, said Andre, it's five years since this fall. I were out of work, and wife had been crying all morning. We'd let Link cupboard. I couldn't stand it no longer. So I set out, I didn't know where. We lived at Green Booth then. Somehow my feet turned this way, and I got about a mile from four gates yonder, when down came rain like sky were opened. Well, I tranched on through it till I came to a lane. I can see it now full of red leaves, and the water guggling in ditches, cowed like, and thwin blowing out for leather, and all leaves fluttering about like they were birds. Oh, Mother Chatters might have been after him with a broom, and by goff, if I didn't pass under a tree with one of them dark clocks in branches, they call them witches' brooms. Seemed like an ill sign. Then I came to a brig with water as black as they of spades. I stood there and tried to leap my pipe, but it wouldn't leap, for my matches had got soddened. Then I see there were a little stile at one side at brig, leading down into a wood, and I thought I'd find a bit of shelter there, so I hopped through. The sky were dark where there weren't no trees, but it was that thick you could have cut blackness with a knife and fork in wood. Bits of leaf glimmered through on red leaves. I found a place under a holly, with ground under as dry as snuff, and I felt tired and threw myself down to rest. It were well it pitched dark where I lay. I could hear it rain, tippling down like it were being poured out of a bucket that would never be empty, and I lies there, wishing I were at home. When, just then, the wind stopped, and I hears a voice that made me blood run cowed. It were rather a nice voice, but there was summer in way it spoke made me heart go pit apart. It were like it were chanting and fierce and a roar I've ever heard, though it weren't loud, but it said every word like it were being burnt into eternity. It were calling a name, a man's Christian name, but oh, more unchristian I ne'er heard, and it goes on to address him, as if he stood there, and all the dark I could see now, and suddenly it dawns on me, as I lies with my breath out for fear, that I'm at in some sort of a wedding between two folk, though I can see neither. Andre stopped and shivered. His pale eyes appeared to look beyond the room he sat in. What he was feeling conveyed itself eloquently to the company. Don't give us the creeps, Andre, said Ben Ling. Creeps isn't a word for what I felt, he said, lifting up his empty glass. He set it down and moistened his lips while someone gave the order he'd forgotten. Well, the voice goes on, repeating a ceremony more or less like they have in Fourgate's church, yon, save for queer little bits pushed in, and save that this same voice answered for both parties, the chap never having a word to say for himself, and now to be seen o' either. The words of the wind up with the wildest of all. I had a good memory at that time, and when I got home I wrote them down, and they sort of fascinated me. I got them off by heart. I used to say em o'er to myself, before going to sleep at nights, just to be thankful I'd a decent lass by my side. I'll just see if I can bethink me. There was silence while Andre pondered. Finally his face lit up with satisfaction. I've getting the beginning, he said, and I'll I come back, for I went o'er em that often. Then closing his eyes he began to murmur the words he had heard in the dark wood five years back. Thus, thus, and thus, he encanted, by the magic of fire, air, and water, I draw thee to me, 
By the seven colours that make earth and heaven, By moon, sun and stars, I draw thee to me. By the four seasons, I draw thee to me. From the four corners of the globe, I will draw thee to me. By my strength and weakness, my hardness, my softness, My tears and my laughter, I draw thee to me. By every strand of my black hair, and the dew of my mouth, I draw thee to me. Mine, mine, all mine, I draw thee into my blood, my heart, my bone, my mind, all mine, 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 for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in health and in sickness, till death does do part. The same grave shall hold us, dust to dust, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, as in the beginning, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, I scatter these red leaves, thus I claim thee, who wast mine from the beginning of the world. Those whom love hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Andrew finished, looked pleased with himself, coughed as he looked at Teddy, and waited. The latter did not speak. And then what? asked Ben Ling. Then I hear summat stern, and a ray of leap filters in somehow, and I sees a lot of red leaves falling in, and sitting among them on a high branch, a young woman, with a face as white as a warmed-up corpse, and black hair round it, and a look in her ear, oh Lord, I don't like to think on it, it were Ellen Mason. I found it out afterwards, but I thought then for sure she were a witch, and I took to my heels, as if old Nick were after me, and I found out afterwards she were Alan Mason, and how they'd all gone into top story, and I puts it to the company of sound English chaps, to say if any young woman was set up in a treetop in a storm, with her hair down her back, wedding herself to a chap that weren't there. Mad? If that's sane, what's mad? And look at her pedigree. Teddy Trick stood upon his pins, drank of his beer, and went out, looking glum. What were the name of him she were wedding herself to? asked the old man with the white hair, softly. Andrew looked at him, tapped his nose, as much as to ask him if he saw any green in the corner of his eyes. Then the talk turned on ferrets, and had barely got going when a step sounded in the doorway. The others started. "'smiling in extra efforts to look at ease. "'Hello, Martin,' they greeted him. "'Come and sit here.' "'The newcomer, a man of some twenty-five years, "'took a seat next to the tramp, "'saying the fire was too warm. "'His voice was monotonous to dullness, "'as if he were dog-tired or without feelings. "'No one would have expected geniality "'from that sallow-tinctured, immobile countenance. "'A broad brow shadowed a pair of brown eyes, that were the antithesis of the rest of the reserved, monotonous man. He was clad in coarse clothes, stained with and smelling of the earth. His eyes turned upon the tramp now. Fielding Day was conscious of a curious antagonism, a losing of half of his own animal magnetism. He was vaguely angry, as one who is challenged, and yet the eyes did not rest on him more than two seconds. Beer? queried the dull voice. The tramp nodded. Martin tapped the bell on the table. Polly Cherry brought in the drinks. Then she served out the stew and oaten cakes. Soon there was no sound but the clatter of spoon and plate, the smacking of lips, and remarks appropriate, with a desultory broken thread of conversations that generally ended among the stew. The tramp ate ravenously. Hungry? asked Martin. Fielding Day nodded. Twenty-four hours sin I doubt he answered unsentimentally. Martin nodded understandingly. Ever been hungry? asked the tramp. The eyes that lit up the old face glowed for a moment. Looking into them, it was as if he saw into a pit of flame. Aye, the tone was more monotonous than ever. Nice comfortable feeling, joked the tramp. Nice to see other men's fires shining and had to sleep under the stars. Thou knows all about it, I see. What part of country did thou tramp? I've never been a tramp, said Martin. I said thou had been hungry, said Fielding. Aye, said Martin, laconically. So I have, but it weren't bread hunger I was thinking on. What's that like? 
Does it pass off after a bit? Does it bite less and less? When thou's eaten, said the tramp, till it's coming round to next meal time, or if thou goes on long enough, fasting, grinding, tightening thy belt, thou gets used to it. And just as thou getting used to it, thou dies. So hunger never dies, said Martin wearily, as one who sees some hope vanish. They sat in silence for some moments. Then Martin found out how far the tramp had come, his being without a penny, without work, without aim. It's a cold night, he remarked, as one who has experienced the deepest horrors of starvation, though he had confessed that he had never been without a roof over his head, or without bread to eat. Aye, said the tramp, it's getting colder, and there's not much poultry sleeping under stars, particularly about two in the morning. Everything sort of shivers. Old Mason might give thee a doss in the barn, said Martin, but they'd have to double earn it tomorrow. The tramp signified his willingness to accompany Martin to the farm and try. If it failed, it only meant sleeping out just the same. In five minutes they were making their way through the night towards Fourgate's farm. They were walking into a boundless blackness save for the gleam of a few stars. The turf under their feet was soft after the limestone road. Then a deeper blackness rose before them. They were ascending a small hill. It was this that deepened the darkness. Somewhere in the distance a dog barked. The echoes shouted it back. Is it far? began the tramp. His companion did not answer. He had stopped. Fielding felt that he was peering into the gloom. A tiny speck of light penetrated the darkness. It came nearer. Martin took a step or two forwards, then paused again, irresolute. From the depths of his throat stole a muffled oath the tone of which conveyed a weary impotence, irritation, despair, anger, and yet something that had in it admiring wonder. Is the will o' the wisp? asked the tramp. Martin Scott mumbled something in confusion. I think it's Miss Ellen, he said in his monotone, after another silence. She'll be coming for a walk to the yew tree. She generally gets so far of a night. The wavering light came nearer to them, a dark figure was silhouetted on the light made by the lantern. Fielding was walking behind Martin, as the path was narrow. The woman did not see him. Martin, she called. In her voice was the abandon of a wild thing that has been caged, and has slipped out by chance into freedom. Martin! It was a voice with passionate cadence. She might have repeated that name over to herself in a hundred moods, it made the tramp feel one too many, to wonder what she would say next. Even as he wondered, she lifted up her lantern, stared into Martin's mask-like face, and said with a sudden restraint, I was just setting off to the yew tree, that's all, Martin Scott, and the wind got in my blood coming down the hill. Fielding Day did not know whether she had seen him or not, but the next moment her glance included him. He stared back at her, as boldly. Then she turned from him to Martin, ignoring his presence.